protest we have is the youth revival this weekend. Billy and Karen Murphy, their daughter, passed away. Pamela Turner's daughter-in-law, father, passed away. Shirley Walter needs surgery on her heart, but she doesn't have enough white blood cells to have surgery. And Patrick's friend is trying to launch an independent apostolic church. So if we could all pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day, and I thank you for your presence that's going to be in this service today. I pray that you touch every need that was spoken and the ones that are unspoken, that you know what they are, Lord, and you know what the blessing or the touch that they need in their lives tonight, Lord. I pray that you touch them, Lord, and I pray that you send healing into those, Lord, in their bodies who have sickness, Lord, to give direction and clarity, Lord, to the people who need it in this service. And I pray that you be with us in this discussion tonight and the topic. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read a scripture, Psalm 102. It says, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. As Pastor texted earlier, let's step out of our comfort zone tonight and worship God a little more than usual. I know it's Wednesday and we're tired. I am too. It's been a long day. But coming into his house and laying down the weight and exhaustion of today is the main highlight or the main thing that I focus on or I'm excited about from throughout the day. And laying down that weight and that exhaustion is where we'll find true peace and a clear mindset to where we'll be able to have our true worship and true praise throughout the service. So as we sing this first song, let's let go of today and let God work in us in this service and bless us.
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord oh and all the earth will shout your praise our to us, Lord. God, we are thankful that you never give up on us, Lord, in our weakest moments. God, you never fail. You are always with us, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
on him for another moment. We love you, God. Let's not rush it. We love you so much, Jesus. Thank you for being so good to us, Lord, for never failing us, God. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. 
go before the Lord in prayer for which Joseph's getting ready to come teach to us tonight. I uh, think we've got tonight one more night in Elements and then we'll be kind of switching gears a little bit. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but we, this weekend, uh, Alicia's dad is coming to lay the flooring for us in our baptistry area and then uh, we'll be getting the steps and everything cut in. But on April 3rd, we've got a baptism of Kenny and Kelly scheduled. So uh, let's be praying for them and praying for that baptism. Amen. If you if you know of someone that you're working with or that could be could be in be at that point and ready to be baptized, encourage them to do it on April the third. We'll, 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 I'd love to baptize oh ten or twelve, fifteen, twenty. That'd be great. Until I'm just exhausted, can't baptize anymore. <laughs> and then we'll just switch out to somebody else to baptize them. But we got, we got plenty of people to baptize over here, not to be baptized, but they can baptize others. <laughs> But uh, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you need to be baptized. You need the blood applied to your life. So, uh, because that blood is very important. It's your covering. But anyway, so keep that in mind. Keep it, keep those prayers, keep those people in mind as we as we actually get ready to go into those baptismal services. We're going to have a great weekend. That weekend also, Brother Murphy, he is a North American missionary to Jefferson City. He'll be preaching for us that Sunday morning. I'm excited about that. Uh, there's nothing like hearing a missionary preach. And he's a good friend of mine. Got to know him over the last few years, so I'm looking forward to that Sunday morning where he comes and ministers to us. And we have several. Can somebody say several? Get baptized in the name of Jesus, and then several receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Brother Joseph's getting ready to come, and then you can go back and grab you a snack right after we pray and get you some coffee or water or whatever, you, a grape or two or ten. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power of your spirit and the beautiful spirit of praise and worship that's in this house. You are an amazing God. It takes just a few moments, Lord, as we begin to adore you and we begin to lift you up and focus our mind on you, that you begin to feel the atmosphere. I thank you for what you've done for us tonight. I thank you for the blessings you brought into this house. I thank you for the prayers you answered that we brought before you as we opened our service. I thank you for the offering, God, that was given tonight and that you've blessed. We pray now as we're going to the teaching of your word, that our hearts, our minds will be open to receive what your word has for us, God. Not just to hear it, but to hear it and to apply it. Not to be a hearer of the word, but also a doer, God. Help us to take your word and put it in as application into our life. We give you glory for this. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. Somebody say in Jesus' name. Amen. The children can be dismissed. And if you want to grab your snack, you can do that. And Brother Joseph, take it away. Hope everybody's having a wonderful evening tonight. As Pastor said, we've got tonight and one more night. So next Wednesday will be our last session in this module of elements and then after that we will well tonight and then next Wednesday night will be our last session in this module and then we're going to go into something else for for probably between four to six weeks and then we will do this again different same same format discussion but it'll be a different module so we'll be learning some new things all right, for all those that ordered books, they're here for next time. So you'll have workbooks that you can fill in the blank and answer questions on there as well if you'd like to do that. I know some like to follow along in a book. So um, I was just thinking as we were, thanks, Brother Keen, as we were uh, worshiping earlier that um, something that's been on my heart lately is that if we sing songs like we're singing in service tonight throughout the day, in our heart you know the Bible talks about making a melody in your heart to the Lord I really think that it will change our perspective of who God is but also like our perspective of the world around us our perspective of people that we come in contact with every day if we think about his mercy his goodness his kindness then we start to think oh I can show that to other people you know and so it's really important and also 
you know, I'm so glad that the presence of the Lord showed up in this place the way that it did because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so I believe we've got some freedom in this place today, and I'm excited about that. And I'm, you know, from Sunday, the missionaries that came that are missionaries to Belgium, uh, you know, they were talking about their story and how we don't, you know, sometimes we can take the freedom for granted that we have in this nation to worship and come together and fellowship and, and pray. And I just hope that, you know, we never, you know, tonight's going to be a discussion, obviously, but anytime we have a chance to get to an altar, that we never take it for granted, we never pass it up. You know, there's times where, you know, a message may not really even stir me up all that much, but the altar's open and I'm going to go just because that's another opportunity that I have to get close to the Lord and I don't want to pass that up. So tonight we're going to be talking about last things, so basically the last days. So tonight we're really going to be talking about some prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus in his birth, his life, and even his death. And then next week we're going to be talking more about uh, the rapture coming, Jesus coming back, and um, the judgment. So tonight will be more about prophecies. So after Jesus' crucifixion, I mean, just think about putting yourself in the shoes of the disciples and the one that you've been following, the one that you gave up your life for. You know, Peter was a fisherman, gave up his life to follow Jesus, uh, gave up, you know, his profession. You got to think you're following Jesus for these years and then he dies. You know, imagine the hope that just seems crushed at this moment. You know, and all of his disciples are, you know, gathering together, discouraged, fearful, you know, hiding behind closed doors and stuff because the Jesus that they followed was crucified for blaspheming and, and they were associated with him. So they could probably think that their lives are also in danger. So when a report came that Jesus had risen from the dead and his tomb was empty, it was hard for them to believe that statement. I mean, they knew Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, but this is a different story. You know, Jesus rose others from the dead, but this is himself raising himself from the dead. Is it actually possible? So their hopes were crushed in this moment, and they thought that they had no future. So I think it's important that we really understand where they're at. And they could not imagine, you know, the glorious event of Jesus raising from the dead actually occurring. Uh, but as as Cleopas, I'm trying to say his name right, Cleopas, <laughs> and a friend walked along a road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They discussed the shocking and disappointing things that had just happened within these past few days. So they believed that Jesus was the prophet, that he was the Messiah that they hoped would deliver Israel from the Roman authority at that time. But they were sad because Jesus had been put to death. So their hopes crush you know they're they're walking along in this road and they're they're sad and these men knew some of their friends claimed that Jesus's tomb was empty but they had a hard time really making sense of everything so suddenly a third man co comes up so it's Cleopas his friend they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus and now a third man joins them and they didn't know who it was but he asked them why they were so sad and what they were talking about and they thought that he was a stranger who knew nothing of the events that just happened in the last few days. He didn't know anything about this. But after they told him what had happened to Jesus and what their friends were saying about the, the tomb being empty, he said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. So then starting with the first books and continuing through all the Old Testament the stranger explained everything about the Messiah. So let's all turn to Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 26. We're going to read these couple verses. Well, really, this is what I just read, actually, but you can write it down if you want to. It says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So this is Jesus speaking to them. And so when they get to their house where they're going to stay, this stranger seemed like he was going to walk down the road even further. But when Cleopas and his friend urged him to stay, 
he joined them for a meal. So the stranger was like, all right, you know, I'll come in and I'll, I'll eat with you. So after he blessed and break the bread, their guests gave some to them. And then instantly their eyes were opened and they realized who this was. This wasn't a stranger at all, but this was Jesus himself sitting in their midst after being raised from the dead. And so as soon as he revealed himself to them, he disappeared, instantly was gone. And at that moment, Jesus just vanishes. So they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened up to us the scriptures? So they thought the whole time that this was a stranger walking with them. And before he broke the bread and actually shared it with them, they didn't realize that it was Jesus. So immediately they walked back to Jerusalem where more of the... Jesus' disciples were, actually the 11 of the 12 disciples were there too, and discussing, they were discussing the resurrection and his appearance to Peter, and Cleopas and his friends shared their news. And as they were talking, Jesus appeared in all of their midst, saying, peace be unto you. All right, and everyone there was terrified. So Jesus shows up, and everyone is just terrified, like, what in the world. Like, I just imagine somebody that you're close to passes away and they just pop up in the room. That would be freaky. <laughs> so I could understand where they're at. So they're all terrified. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? It's kind of funny that, that he would ask that question, you know, because obviously you're alive and we didn't know you were going to be alive. But he said, why are you troubled and why do you thoughts arise in your hearts? Jesus asked, behold, my hands and my feet that it is, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So he was standing there, not as a spirit, but in the flesh. And he had this, the scars on his hands, the scars on his feet. And he said, you know, you can, you can see my scars. This is me. And often, you know, I had this thought as I was studying this, you know, the disciples later on after Jesus ascends back into heaven, uh, they are beaten for preaching Jesus. They're, they're, beaten for speaking the name of Jesus and proclaiming his name and teaching of the gospel. And so I, I think sometimes, you know, when they saw their own scars and what they endured, or maybe one of the other disciples, you know, I see his scars and what he's enduring, maybe their, their minds went back to this moment where Jesus is standing there in their midst and saying, here's my scars that I endured for you. You know, here's my, my the pain and suffering that I went through for you. And so, and it, it's very interesting that the disciples rejoiced and that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. You know, it's, it's just, it's mind-boggling and it's amazing all at the same time. And so Jesus' followers here were, they were so overjoyed, but could not believe what they saw and heard before. But now they had seen it right there, seen him right there in front of him. And he asked them if they had any food Jesus did, and so they gave him fish and a honeycomb, and he ate right there in their presence. And when he was finished eating, Jesus said, There are words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. So he's saying, I did speak some things to you while I was with you. Maybe it went over your head. You didn't understand it. But he said, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in Psalms concerning me. Then to help them better understand the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus says, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. It was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, and wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So there, you know, he's talking about the Holy Ghost. So Jesus revealed himself and said that he was the one that was supposed to fill, fulfill all these Old, Old Testament prophecies. And so we're going to look into some of these prophecies tonight. And I'm going to need multiple volunteers uh, because we're going to be reading multiple scriptures kind of around the same time. And I can also get you these scriptures after this if you want every single one of them. I can do that. That's fine. But I'll need a volunteer to read uh, Matthew chapter 1. And if you'll, it's verse 18 and then verse, verses 22 through 23. So who wants to volunteer to read that? You don't have to read it just yet. We're going to read 
kind of popcorn bouncing back and forth. Okay, so she's got the first one, Matthew 1, 18, 22 through 23. All right, and I'll need somebody to read Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. All right, pastor's got that one. Yes, Luke 4, 16 through 21. And then I'll need someone to read in Matthew. Yep, in Matthew uh, 1, chapter 1. No, hang on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 through 35. So, got anybody? all right, Sister Catherine. And I'll, I'll say these out loud again so you kind of know what you're reading once we get there. And then I'll need someone to read Acts chapter 2, verse 25 through 32. All right, Alicia will read in Acts. Awesome. Thank you for vol. She got voluntold. Voluntold what to do. <laughs> Acts 2, 25 through 32. Okay. So. All right. All right. So, I am going to read. So, what we're going to do here, I'm going to read the Old Testament prophecy, and then I'm going to have somebody read the fulfillment of how Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. So Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, so whoever has Matthew chapter 1, 18. So read verse 18 and then verses 22 through 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Spirit. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. All right, so what was the prophecy there fulfilled about Jesus' birth? That he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. All right, now I'm going to read Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. <clears throat> and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So this is in Isaiah. This is a prophet speaking way before Jesus is ever born. So the fulfillment is in Luke chapter 4, 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there were delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So this is very cool, because... This prophecy was in Isaiah. So he literally gets the book, reads the prophecy, Isaiah's prophecy, and then sits down, and everybody's looking at him, and he says, today it's fulfilled. Like, I'm, this, is, this is me. I'm doing this. So th he's talking about his ministry. Yeah, my, yeah, that's literally what I was thinking while I was reading. He's just like, everybody's looking at him. It's fulfilled today. Like, mic drop, walk out. But it was just... It's a, it's a really cool scripture there. And so he's talking about, this is my ministry. My ministry goes, you know, from the prophet was talking about it, and now it's happening right now. It's being fulfilled right in front of you right now. So this was the prophecy about his ministry. And Psalm, uh, let's see. I'm going to read, actually. Okay, so Psalm 22 verse 1 and verse 18 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why 
art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my, of my roaring? And verse 18 says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So this is David talking. All right, Isaiah 53, verse 7 through 9 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, was, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he, was he stricken, and he was made... His grave with the, he has made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. So if you remember Jesus being mocked and spat upon, he really didn't say hardly anything. During, they would ask him questions and he just wouldn't answer. And so it's saying as a sheep is, is brought before the, sla the slaughter and the shears is dumb. So he wasn't saying anything. And so he opened not his mouth is what it's saying. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generations? It's talking about he, it says, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. This is Isaiah talking like he is also, you know, a Jew. From the, the transgressions of my people is he stricken. And he was, he made his grave with the wicked. You know, he hung there next to thieves and, and those that did wicked. And he, he made his, with the rich, his death because there was one named Joseph, right? And he paid for, for his burial place, basically. He wanted him to be buried in a certain place. So let's read Matthew, verse 27, 32. We're going to read 32 through 35, and then 46 and 48. And 48. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots." Verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. So now we see here the prophecy fulfilled about his death. They parted his garm his vesture and cast lots. <clears throat> I'm going to read Psalm ver, or chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. It says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence, there is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. So that fulfillment, Alicia, is Acts chapter 2, 25 through 32. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you for the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him of the fruit of his body, according to his flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, which we are all witnesses. So Peter's speaking here, and this is like the beginning of his, you know, Acts 2.38 statement, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then he preaches salvation. But this is what he's talking about at first, and he starts to bring up these old prophecies that were prophesied, and he's saying Jesus fulfilled this. Like this is the fulfillment. Jesus is the Messiah. So there are so many prophecies in the Bible 
and they all have like a wide range of fulfillment. Scholars say that there are somewhere between 8,000 to 10,000. 8,000 to 10,000 prophecies fulfilled. So that is crazy. That's awesome. But some prophecies are about the people of Israel. Some are about Christ, the Messiah, and others are about various individuals, uh, the church, or even world events at that time. So the first verse of the Bible begins with the words, in the beginning. You know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So if that, if the Bible starts that way, then that means there, there is an end. There will be an end. So in biblical history, Jacob called to his 12 sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So this is in Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. He says that I shall tell you what shall befall you in the last day. So this verse translated, is translated into latter in Deuteronomy 31 and 29, and both words mean the same thing. So we have to ask ourselves, when do the last days begin? When does it actually happen? Well, you know, on the day of Pentecost, Peter you know, started speaking about the prophet Joel, what he prophesied. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and, and you know, have dreams and see visions. And so he speaks this and basically saying, you know, this is that which was spoken by the prophet of Joel that would happen in the last days. So we have to believe that the last day began then, that that was the beginning of the last days. And so we know this because Peter is the one that started explaining the events. And in Acts, that's actually Acts 2, right before again, he, he starts talking about salvation. So because so many prophecies were fulfilled before the day of Pentecost, time, you know, we don't have enough time to study each one of those. But we can talk about the ones that are not yet fulfilled, that haven't happened yet. So the last days began, like I just said, on Pentecost. And the last things include the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus, and also final judgment. So we're going to go over a little bit of the rapture of the church tonight, and then we're going to kind of wind down, and then we'll, we'll dig back into the rest of it next week. But let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. If you're writing these down. I'll, I'll just repeat it again just to help you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. We're also going to read another uh, passage, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 54. But I'll let everybody, you know, flip, flip to 1 Thessalonians, and then we can go to 1 Corinthians. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Can I get a volunteer to read that? Anybody? Thank you, Landon. 13 through 17, correct? Yes. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from a heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, which we, are, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I love that last part. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Like, that's where I want to be, and we're going to be there forever. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 54. And I feel like Landon's mic was booming and I started talking and it just seemed so tiny. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 54. Does anybody want to read that? All right. Thank you, Sister Sherry. Yes. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, corruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Whoa. Now it's booming. No. <laughs> I need to start talking in a deep voice. Deep voice. But what's it say here? And anybody's free. Everyone is free to answer. Who does it say will rise first when the Lord descends from heaven? The dead in Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise first. How long will those who meet the Lord in the air be with him? I said it earlier. Shall I ever be with the Lord? Oh, man. That's such a good hope to hang on to. Uh, what will happen to all believers, dead and alive, when the trumpet sounds? That's right. We'll be called up together with them in the air. And I'm scared of heights, so we'll see what, what actually what that actually looks like. You know, is there going to be clouds right under me so I don't feel like I'm going to fall? Or, you know, yeah. We'll, we'll see. I don't know if I'm going to be one of the dead in Christ or if I'm going to be alive when he comes back, but we're all going to be in the air. So, yeah, don't look down. I'll be looking at the Lord if he's above me. Uh, it's, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it tells us how quickly this will occur. What does it say there? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, very quickly, very quickly. So the first century church lived in anticipation of Jesus' return. So we're talking about the ones that were there right after Jesus' ascension. They're waiting for his return. They're like anticipating it. So as far as they know, Jesus could come back at any time. You know, any time. So they had hoped that he would, and his earliest disciples had seen him ascend out of their sight when two men dressed in white, apparently angels, said to them, Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up at, at Jesus that had just ascended? The same Jesus which was taken up from you will come in a like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So they heard that and they're thinking, you know, he could return at any time. And so the memory of this awesome event was stamped in their minds. Like they just it was like imprinted in their minds. You can't forget something like that, I don't feel like. So, and they talked about it regularly, reminding one another of the certainty that Jesus would return. So, in the first sermon preached in the church, Peter quoted prophecies from the Old Testament to show how they were fulfilled by Jesus and alert everybody listening to the fact that Jesus is going to return. So, Peter said, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. That's Acts 2.32. Then Peter quoted from Psalm 110. And this was a psalm that foretold the events associated with the second coming. So Psalm 110 associates with the events of the second coming of Jesus. And so Jew, Peter's Jewish audience then, they're like on their toes. You know, he, they, he talked about Jesus ascending, Jesus returning. And he's talking to them here on the day of Pentecost. Day of Pentecost. <laughs> Day of Pentecost. It's not Pentecost. There's no Q in there for anybody wondering. The Day of Pentecost. And he quoted the verse. That's where I messed up. I was trying to say quote and Pentecost. Again, I'm getting confused. <laughs> trying to make myself feel better. So, uh, Peter quoted the first verse of this psalm. It recalled the entire psalm to the minds of those who heard him, including its conclusion with the Messiah's ultimate victory over all human opposition. So here, he, he basically speaks of a psalm that everybody's familiar with, and know, and he's talking about the Messiah's ultimate victory over all human opposition. So this victory would require the Messiah's presence on earth. So they knew Jesus is going to come back. So since Peter proclaimed that Jesus was the promised Messiah, this meant that Jesus would return to accomplish the final defeat of his enemies. So now, understanding that, it makes perfect sense that these people would respond with, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, he has been, he's died, been buried, resurrected, and now he's going to come back and judge. And he, he was the Messiah. You know, they realized this Jesus was the Messiah. So it's very little wonder that they said, what shall we do? And so Peter's interest in the second coming didn't stop after the day of Pentecost. He was very intrigued by Jesus coming again. In his first letter, Peter wrote these words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy 
hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And, and listen closely to this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus. So here, Peter's talking about you're suffering many things. You're going through these temptations. And so he's teaching how the response of Christians should be to the suffering and, and to all of these things. And it was to hang on to the hope that Jesus is going to return for his church. So he's reminding them, like, hang on to the fact that Jesus is going to come back for us. And though we're suffering things right now, we can rejoice because of that. So Peter referred repeatedly to the second coming in his letter. He said, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But the end of all things is at hand, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So the elders which are among you, he continues to say, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a, a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And then he says in 1 Peter 5 and 1, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, we shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that's just another awesome promise and reminder. We shall receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. So since Peter preached about the second coming of Christ in his sermon on the first day of existence of the church. So Pentecost is the first day of existence of the church, and Peter starts to talk about the second coming of Christ. It's no surprise that it was a major point of his concern in all the letters that he wrote that, that you know, he was talking about the second coming. Like, he said it on Pentecost, he wrote about it in his letters, and he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, which basically means those that mock and make fun of, walking after their own lusts and saying, and, you know, I'll put in a sarcastic voice, where is the promise of his coming? You know, where, you know, is he actually coming? For since thy fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So they're saying, you know, he hasn't come back yet. Is he actually going to come back? You know, things just continue. The, the world keeps spinning. People, you know, are born. They live. They die. It just keeps happening. You know, they're, they're mocking, saying, is he actually going to come back? So Peter realized, and, and that's why he wrote in this letter, he realized the tendency of skeptics to wonder if Jesus would really fulfill everything that he promised. And so about his rapture and also about his return. So even today... Some people are skeptical about what Scripture says concerning Jesus' return. So we're going to get into that a little bit. So Peter went on to assure, and he said, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack. Is, I love this verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So he's talking about describing what is going to happen in those times. And he's saying, it's not my will that any should perish through this. It's not my will, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to repentance. And he goes on to say, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting? So this word hasting there, it says hasting unto the coming of the day of God. So we're hasting his coming. And what that means is to await eagerly. You're eagerly, eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus. 
sound like I'm about to speak in tongues up here or something, the way I'm talking. But we're hasting the coming of Jesus. And so he's saying here, seeing that everything's going to be dissolved, you need to think about yourself, the types of conversations that you're having, that you make sure that you're having holy conversations and you're waiting eagerly the return of Jesus. So where it, it goes on to say, where in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. So look for the new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we have to understand that you have to be righteous if you want to dwell in that new heaven and that new earth. Peter wasn't alone in his interest in the second coming because Paul also wrote about the same things. He said, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So this reminds me of a, a scripture that we read in the past in one of the lessons that was talking about God wants to prevent, present to himself a glorious church without spot and blameless. So he says the same thing here. He says, be diligent that you may be found in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. So that's actually in Second Peter. So this is Peter talking about Paul, talking about the second coming of Jesus. So although Paul was not there when Jesus ascended, his shared awareness that Jesus would return is seen in his writings. He wrote about the translation of the saints, and that's what we just read in 1 Thessalonians and also 1 Corinthians. So that was Paul that wrote that. So he knew that Jesus was going to return. So it is to be expected, and I'm about to wind this down so everybody can kind of you know, stand up, stretch out if you want to. But it is expected that when we talk about the rapture of the church or the second coming, that people wonder, you know, when is this actually going to happen? When is this going to take place? But in Matthew, it says that no one knows. You know, Jesus is teaching that no one knows the time or the hour when the Son of Man will come. So for us to know isn't going to happen. You know, we can want to know all we want, but it's never going to happen. But Paul understood this and wrote, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So we don't know when it's going to come, but we know it's going to come as a thief in the night. We know now that when we are transcended, when, when the rapture takes place, it's going to be in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. So these things are going to happen quickly. Paul believed, though, that it was possible for the rapture to occur during his lifetime. Because he wrote, We which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We read that earlier. <laughs> we got somebody reading it now. Awesome. Thank you for volunteering. You know. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's good. We got a volunteer now. Uh, see if she'll read next week, too, if you don't mind. <laughs> but in every generation, we can all stand now. We're about to, about to close this down. But in, in every generation, there is a way that believers have spoken about the urgency. You know, we hear people get behind the pulpit, speak about the urgency of Jesus' return, preaching messages, and we should. Because we, we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know the time. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But we know it's going to happen in a moment. And so we should love the thought. That's something, too. Uh, here in Second Timothy 4 and 8, it talks about uh, he shall give a crown of righteousness to all those that love his appearing. So there's something to be said about loving the appearing of the Lord. You know, if you're trying to do right, living righteously, living a holy lifestyle, and you're you're just waiting eagerly for Jesus to come back. You're going to love the moment when he does. And, and there's one thing that I think about sometimes when I think about loving Jesus' return. It says if we have love for the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in us. And so we got to figure out, you know, which one do we love more? Because I, I honestly think that if we're so attached to the things of this world and we're not waiting for the Lord's return, we're not really 
looking forward to him coming back for the church because there's way more than what's down here. There is so much more. And so I don't want to miss that moment, miss that twinkling of an eye moment because I'm so attached to everything else that's around me. I'm so attached to my possessions or my money or my job or whatever distractions are going on in my life that I, I miss that moment. I don't get to spend all of eternity and be with the Lord forevermore. You know, that's where we should all desire to dwell. So let's go before the Lord in prayer, and we're going we're gonna to end this. And, and next week, we're going to talk about him returning some more, and we're going to talk about the judgment. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your presence and to gather together as a church once again. Lord, I thank you so much for every single member of the body of Christ, Lord. You have made us up of many members, and we all serve a purpose in this church. God, I pray that we will not be so attached to the things of this world. I pray that we will be looking forward to the coming, your coming, Lord. When you come again for this church, Lord, that we will be caught up in the air and we will get to be with you forevermore. Lord, I pray that this will continue to be our hope and continue to be the reason that we rejoice. Even when we suffer, even when we go through things that, that are hard in our life, Lord, help us to hang on and rejoice that we are going to get to be with you forevermore. And God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you so much for being in our midst tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.